our Father's Arms, nestled in the beautiful foothills of Appalachia in the southeastern United States and northeast Alabama, our Father's Arms is a place of healing and deliverance. Each day, we turn our hearts toward God's Word. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, one for each day of the month. The proverb for the day provides a springboard and commentary to the rest of Scripture. We invite you to join us as we relax, open our Bibles, and trust Him to speak to our hearts. I'm Bob and George. Some folks so busy making a living that they ain't got time to live. Some so busy taking and getting that they ain't got time to give. Some obsessed with trying to be blessed by a lady named Lady Luck. Fall flat on their face, distressed, disgraced, claiming there ain't no gravity. Attitude. The, the earth just sucks. The earth just sucks. <laughs> let's, try, let's try that again. Try that one again. Yeah, the earth just sucks. Claiming there ain't no gravity. The earth just sucks. They need an attitude. Gratitude, so they won't come undone, so they won't come unglued. Needing an attitude, an attitude of gratitude. Just look at the blue in the sky, or just look at the butterfly fly by, just look at the trees so high, just look at the sparkle in the little child's eyes, just look at the man on the cross. That's what eternal life costs Just to think about his love for you And that'll show sure enough give you An attitude of gratitude Attitude, attitude, attitude Attitude, attitude, attitude. attitude, attitude of gratitude Attitude, attitude, attitude Attitude of gratitude Help us now Attitude, attitude, attitude Attitude of gratitude Y'all still asleep? Attitude, attitude, attitude. What a way to wake up. Attitude of gratitude. George. Attitude, attitude, attitude. Attitude of gratitude. Just look at the blue in the sky. Just look at the butterfly fly by. Just look at the trees so high. Just look at the sparkle in that little child's eyes. Just look at the man on the cross. That's what eternal life costs. Just to think about his love for you. That'll show enough give you an attitude of gratitude. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep your seat. <laughs> All right. Sometimes people stare at George and me as if they think we've gone crazy. Like when we smile with a song in our heart. Even though oftentimes the times are hard. They say, man, you gotta be putting us on. The economy's a mess, and that ain't all that's gone wrong. Terrorists are mad, man, they getting the bomb. You ought to be worried sick instead of singing some dumb song. I say, friend, part of what you say is true. Wasn't very long ago I felt the same way as you do. Then Jesus Christ made my life brand new. And we can't stay down, cause we know we're heaven bound. And we know that goodness and mercy will always follow me. And I will dwell in his house forever more. I know that goodness. Goodness, mercy, mercy. We'll always follow George and me, and we will dwell in his house forever more. You see, there's really no need to worry when everything works for your good. We've forsaken all the fuss and all the frantic hustle bustling, even though we never thought that we could. Oh, since Jesus made a brand new man out of me, set my sights on eternity. We're all his and we always will be. He came into my heart and he set my soul free. He came into my heart and set my soul free. He came into my heart and set my soul free. He came into my heart and he set my soul free. 
set my heart and set my soul free. Came to my heart and set my soul free. Came to my heart and set my soul free. And we know that goodness, goodness and mercy, mercy will always follow me, and I will dwell in this house forever. Oh, 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 we know the goodness, goodness, mercy, mercy. We'll always follow George and me, and we will dwell in this house forever. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're starting to wake up a little bit like that, and uh. Let's see, we had another one, didn't we? Mm -hmm. we in fact, let's do this one right here. You, you'll know it, you'll know right when you come in because we practiced. Okay. <clears throat> Is it the truth that sets you free? <laughs> I mean, really, John H., you abide my word, my word abides in you, then indeed you're my disciples, you know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Okay, let me ask you this. Is depression freedom? Is worry freedom? Is drug addiction freedom? Is lust freedom? Is anger freedom? Is selfishness freedom? Is greed freedom? Well, if the truth will set you free, what is it puts us in bondage? A lie. <clears throat> it's a false belief system. Only a child can see this. A theologian walks right past it. Is it possible for this child to be free? Not until I'm willing to agree I'm a child and I don't know much. And I think I got life figured out. And I'm wandering around down here hoping nobody else can see how terrified I am inside. And I've been pretending to be a tough guy so long just to try to survive. When deep down inside, I'm scared to death. And I don't want anybody to see me crying at night. It's that real person he comes to reveal himself to the way, the truth, and the life. Now this is, uh, I was in a prison in uh, Glastonbury, England years ago. It's just, I mean, this place looked like some Boris Karloff movie or some horror place. And the, and the chaplain there had invited me to come over. We were at the rock festival there at Glastonbury. And he said, bring a guitar and come over and do a chapel for us. And so I went in there, these big old doors. I think they still had a galatine there. We chopped people's heads off. I mean, this, this place was just um, surreal going in there. And we went into the chapel, and these men were there. And they, they were mocking me. Yeehaw! Because, you know, I talk like a southerner because I am one. I can't help it. <laughs> you know, and it's like, and there's one guy on the front was was particularly rude, uh, has, har, har, harassing me and heckling me, you know. And you know, the thing about it is it really didn't bother me because uh, I didn't ask to go there. And I knew God had put me there. And I just, after so much of that, you know, nobody's listening to me. They were too busy making fun of me and laughing at each other, you know. Some clown had come to town, you know. I said, fellas, you know, I, I live thousands of miles from here that way. And day after tomorrow, I'm going to be going home. And, uh, but I'll tell you what, this guy right here, the one that was heckling me the most, I said, you know, apparently you got something worth saying. Here's my guitar. I'll just sit down. And, of course, everybody in there had to live with him. <laughs> so, no, no, man, shut up. <laughs> so they turned on him. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, and it was like the Lord, the Holy Spirit, it had given me their ear, and this came out of me, 
and I said, look, man, you know, I'm, I'm not, I really care about you, and I'm not threatened by you or anything like that, and, and you being smart didn't get you here, all right? <laughs> and I'll tell you, let me tell you why you're a clown and why you're trying to impress each other and why you acting like strutting around here like you got it all together. I'll tell you why, because living inside of you is a scared little boy. Because you know you're going to die. Now let's get real. Let's get to the truth. You don't want to think about it. You're too busy trying to impress each other to maybe pretend you're a tough guy and you're a coward. Just like me and the rest of us, man. You're going to die. We're sitting on death row. You never know when your number's going to be called. That happens to me every time I go to a restaurant. It's got those little vibrators. You know, it's kind of crowded. And, you know, uh, Yogi Berra says, you don't want to go. He says, nobody wants to go to that restaurant. It's too crowded. <laughs> Yogi Berra, check out his quotes. <laughs> Do you get that? Is it too early in the morning? <laughs> nobody wants to go to that restaurant because it's too crowded. <laughs> anyway, he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> He's great. Isn't he? Anyway, laughter is God's hand on the back of hurting world. All right, so, so you go to a restaurant and they give you that buzzer when they got a table for you and you're sitting out there talking with your friends and everything. You never know when that thing's going to go off. And you're holding a buzzer. But it's not a table in the restaurant to eat. It's to leave your body. What then? Tough guy. <laughs> Bless you. That's awesome, isn't it? Well, you, uh, yeah, that's uh, th a sneeze is wonderful, isn't it? Just other other bodily functions is just great, you know. <laughs> 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 All right, now there. Uh, before we leave this biological thing right here, it coughs and sneezes and all that stuff and gets tummy aches or whatever. It, you know, it's just like you know that the, the day's coming when you will put on your last stick of deodorant. <laughs> The day is coming when you will, you, you'll smoke your last cigarette, I promise you, or take your last dip. The day's coming when you're going to swallow your last bit of food. The day's coming when you're not going to see that person next to you anymore, physically. And when is your buzzer going to go off? You ain't got a clue. So you're going to stir around here acting like a tough guy? So I'm telling these guys, this was back before the buzzer days, back to the Glastonbury prison. And I said, I'm here for 45 minutes to share with you the hope I found. And you know, it was beautiful. Everybody in that chapel, in just a few minutes, we were on our knees, humbling our hearts before Him. That was a precious time. I'm glad to remember that. But um, <coughs> Now, here's the truth that sets you free. Let's just, let's just cut through it every bit and get right down to the truth. Now, will you please listen it's just all I ask. Listen very carefully to what you're about to hear. Whatever time brings your way, time will surely take it away. Friend, family, foe, come and go. Nothing here is here to stay. Nothing here is here to stay. Straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel. Straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel. Straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel. There's a way we've been living our lives. It's just the way we've been living our lives. Making something out of nothing, nothing out of something. How blind can we be? Living in a panic, spitting the Atlantic. We take ourselves way too seriously we take ourselves way too seriously we keep straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel is the way we've been living our lives just the way we've been living our lives Living under the S-U-N is all vanity. 
living under the S-O-N will restore your sanity. Life can be F-U-N. We can be worry-free knowing all is going to be okay. So go ahead and let go. I go ahead and let go. Go ahead and let go. And go ahead and let go. 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 Help George out. Go ahead and let go. 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 What you'll have to let go of one day anyway. Anyway. Just the way we've been living our lives. Just the way we've been living our lives. <laughs> okay. You mean go ahead and let go of what you'll have to let go of one day anyway. You know what the real Jesus says? Not accept me and I'll help you through your self-centered life. The real Jesus says, will you let it all go? Those who love their earthly life will forfeit eternal life. Those who love not their own earthly life will have eternal life. You are living in a world, you and I are living in a world of adversity. And every human being is either being overcome or overcoming. How do I overcome? Let me ask you this. At this stage in my life, I have been overcome by the adversity. That's why I'm miserable. I'm miserable as hell, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know why? Because I'm being overcome. How do I start overcoming? In Revelation 12, he says, We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, loving not our own earthly life, even unto death. And Jesus says, Those who lose their life for my sake, how do you lose your life? Have you ever tried to lose something? You can't try and do it. I'm always losing this thing. But it's not because I'm trying. If I was trying to hide it from myself, I'd know right where it is. How are you going to lose your life? I want to be free. I want to come over, overcome. How do I do that? And it's not what you do. It's what, it's what you and I stop doing. We stop clinging to and possessing our earthly biological life. Ecclesiastes calls it living under the S-U-N. It says all vanity. Here's a guy who had everything. All vanity. And he goes right into Song of Songs right after Ecclesiastes and Solomon says, now here's everything. It's a love affair. It's a Shulamite maiden that's being... Uh, the lovers pursuing. It's a wonderful love story right there that it's, it's so uh, graphic at times you don't hear it preached too much in the Bible Belt, but Song of Songs. I wish they would preach it. it is a well, you're hearing it right now, darling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a beautiful love affair between the Shulamite maiden and the, and the lover approaching. In the, in the first chapter of Song of Songs, there's a kiss on the mouth. You only got one mouth. <laughs> There's this fateful embrace of two becoming one, the mystery of marriage. It's Christ the husband, his bride, the church. All right, what we do is we let go of everything else, and that can only happen when you've got a revelation of him who's pursuing you. Right in the midst of all my selfishness, he totally understands this human experience because he came into the planet as a human to experience it. All of the stress, all the frustration, all the temptations that you and I have. He understands where you are and he's touched by the feelings of your infirmities and he cries every tear with you even when the pain is self-inflicted. That's how much he loves you. And as we begin to see him and open up to him, we forget all about ourselves. You lose yourself in the awareness of his presence. Christ consciousness. You 
take words like that and call it new age. There ain't no new age. It's old age. <laughs> you know, get, go. It's like a, get the God awareness, the almighty, the mysterious one. And when a human being awakens to the revelation of him, humility is a result of that. We're going to see that in a minute in, in Proverbs 22. It's not something you try to do. It's something you stop trying to do and you just simply look and let him wash you by his blood and cleanse you and all of a sudden you you realize he's got you covered so you don't have to worry about you anymore now that's the ideal and and we're no go ahead and let go of what you'll have to let go of one day anyway how do i let go of somebody i love to let go of someone doesn't mean turn your back on them It's too deep for words, passes all understanding. Be a lie to try to analyze or describe what I feel. I confess that life can sometimes be so demanding. Oh, the sorrow I've known from holding on to the things that pass away, and it's not even real. And I'm learning to let go of all that betrays me. I'm learning to come in out of a world so cold, Joining those few precious souls who have eyes to see, I'm finally catching on to letting go. It's not that I don't love you or need you anymore. The truth is I even love you more deeply than before. But that love that's pure is on a non-clinging basis. Now watch how perverted love concept has been in, in our minds. Someone says, uh, boy, I love fish. Do you love fish? You know, a top of the river or something like that. Now think about that. You love fish, so what do you do? You catch it, and you kill it, and you clean it, and you eat it. That's love with a hook in it. And when some man comes and tells you I love you, he said, I just want to use you. And he, he thinks this love is totally deceived. If it, if it feels like it, it must be wrong. Love with a hook in it is not love at all. That's fish love. If you want to see what the love that never fails looks, looks like, look at the cross. Selflessness. Now, when I will let him love me, then I'm not looking to my wife or my friends for what I can only get from him. And I'm loving you on a non-clinging basis. If I fish love you and I'm wanting to use you to make me feel good or look good, and when you are using me because I can do something for you and calling it love when you're doing that, that's, what, that's the heart of codependency is, is two ticks without a dog. It's two people clinging to each other calling it love. But when I look to him and I truly give consideration to who this person is that split history in two from a blood-soaked cross, Emmanuel, God's with us, and my eyes start to be opened up to the reality of the way, the truth, and the life. I forget all about me. It's not that I don't love you or need you anymore, but I don't need you to validate me as a human being of dignity and respect my personal validation of significance is found at a cross. And when I accept God's acceptance of me, I don't need the acceptance of men or a man or a woman. And now I'm free to love men and women with no hook in it. It's not that I don't love you or need you anymore. The truth is I even love you more deeply than before. But you see, I've met the Savior. I wrote this verse for my wife of 48 years. 
It's not that I don't love you or need you anymore. I'd never turn my back on you. But letting you go is not turning my back on you. It's releasing to the, you to the one you belong to because I have released me to the one I belong to. And the truth is, I even love you more deeply than before. But you see, I've met the Savior. He's calling me to a home. I'm moving off of the shifting sand. It's the rock of ages I'm building on. And I'm finally catching on to letting go. Go ahead and let go. Go ahead and let go. Go ahead and let go of what you'll have to let go of one day anyway. Whatever you possess down here, you will one day give up. Will you go down to the grave clinging to your stuff or other people? <clears throat> or will you surrender all in the arms of love? Will you give up the love of your earthly life in exchange for a life of love? I want to tell you a wonderful advantage that you and I have over people who have been taught all their life they're good and they're moral because they don't use drugs and they make plenty of money and they've all been in church all their life. When you've done a pretty good job in, rep in wrecking your own reputation, It kind, of, it, it kind of takes away any uh, temptation to go in there and try to pretend you're somebody when everybody, you know, you've been exposed. You're a sinner. And look where it got you. And that world out there will shame you. That's the same world that shames him. He didn't come for them. It's the sick that need a physician. And you're not going to go to the physician if you don't know you're sick. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. I've done too far. And somebody takes a Bible and say the unpardonable sin. I'll tell you, the unpardonable sin is not coming to the light. And you can start coming to the light anytime. You're pardoned. Come on. There's much love comes out of somebody that's been forgiven much. <laughs> I can remember, like, ye like yesterday or this morning, 3 a.m., I'm going to get a gun and end it. And I've been up for days. Don't you get near that crystal meth again. Unless you want to just turn your soul over to the demons. You've got to reject Jesus. Let me tell you what, it's not saying no to that. And then saying yes to Him. When you say yes to Him, you're saying no to that. It's not about getting rid of the sin. It's about coming to the Savior. He's already taken care of the sin. Do you see that? i got to resist temptation. i got to resist temptation. No, you don't. Just don't resist Him. I ain't anti-sin. I'm pro-Savior. And this attitude of gratitude is improving my health and my behavior. <laughs> Things are not the way that they seem. There's much more than can be seen. Oh, what a joy it brings. You can anti anything. Now, when I let him love me, now we're moving on in the Song of Solomon. And we're living under the S-O-N. And we surrender all in the arms of love. We give up our earthly life in exchange for a life of love. And we let go of everything this world is made up of. Hallelujah. We're at the 22nd day of the month. That's Proverbs 22. And here's the first verse. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. Uh, great riches definitely in, in, includes a bank account. You know, one of the... Uh, we're talking about we're willing to call truth truth, right? Now, now this rich young ruler, you know the story of the rich young ruler, <clears throat> said he had many possessions and he runs up to Jesus and says, Master, what must I do to have eternal life? 
And he said, why do you call me good? A good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? He said, why do you call me good? So see, he does what every one of us do. He's eating out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We judge people as good and we judge people as bad and we judge, you know, and the tree of life was within you. That tree of life is the Lord Jesus Christ that comes to live within you. Now when I'm eating and feeding on the tree of life, then I'm not walking around with a gavel judging everybody else good or bad. So who told you I was good? You love everybody with no hook in it. Amen. You know, you know, uh, without expectation or condition, by the water and the blood you have been born, and the mercy that you're receiving is just naturally being spread to other people, and you're not selfishly using somebody so they can't let you down or disappoint you because you don't have any expectations on them because you really don't need them to validate you as a person. Okay, there's, there's the freedom. All right, now this good name is to be chosen, and he said, uh, rather than great riches... Now, that rich young ruler had many possessions. It's, it's, uh, he goes away. It said Jesus loved him in that, in that pressure. It didn't say he loved him if he'd give up all his possessions. It said Jesus loves him. And so when it broke the Lord's heart, but he went off. He said, now, you lack, you've kept all the commandments. You grew up in church. You've been a good person. You've been successful. You made mom and daddy proud. And, oh, I'm just so proud of you. And you made it in the paper. And you just, uh, and I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just go ahead. At the invitation time, Rich Young Ruler comes to church. He goes up, what must I do to have eternal life? And the preacher says, pray a prayer with me. And uh, we'll get your name on the roll. I'll get you baptized. And you're a big tither. So we'll really, our church will really grow because you're bringing something to it. And instead of sending the rich young ruler away, saying, you go sell everything you own, give it to the poor and then come follow me. You lack that one thing. Now t today in Bible belt buckle Christianity, which is not Christianity at all, many are coming saying he's Christ and deceiving many. Anybody that walks down that aisle and prays a prayer with you, they, they're on board and they got their ticket punched and they're going to go to heaven. They know deep down inside they're lost. But they, they're trying to pretend they're, they're saved and they're right with God. Okay, now that's what happens. Jesus didn't say jump up and come down here. He said sit down and consider just a minute. You've got great possessions, and your great possessions have you chained to the rock of exile from God Almighty. And sometimes your great possessions can be monetary wealth and gold and silver and those things, but oftentimes your possessions can be confidence in your own judgment, the boastful pride of life. Got it all figured out. All those things that are unchildlike. Father, I delight that you have chosen to reveal this to babes, but hide it from the wise and intelligent. And sometimes the confidence in our own judgments, eating out of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're good and you're bad and you're good and you're bad. And you're bad because I don't, and I'm, I'm gooder than you because I don't do what you did. Homosexual. So we're so, we so have great possessions. We can have great possessions of my own academic accomplishments. Or I can be tied to some institution or something. Those are great possessions. Those are riches. Okay, now when I, when I see the rich young realist, well, that can't be me because I don't have a lot of money. Well, mo and most, <coughs> most people don't. But there are other things that you and I have that are our great possessions. It's anything I'm possessing to try to affirm myself as a, as a, a human being worthy of dignity and respect. I'm trying to get it. Now that good name, in Luke 6, uh, 26, Jesus says this, Woe are you when all men speak well of you. Well, what about this proverb here? That good name comes when you let go of your great possessions, if it's money or whatever it is. Now listen, just because you don't give it all away doesn't mean that it owns you. You don't possess it anymore. And you see it all as God's anyway because you're holding the buzzer to when your heart's going to stop beating and you're letting go of what you have to let go of one day anyway. And that's stuff. That's not just stuff, but it's whatever your possessions are. Now here's the freedom. And you see that you're just a channel in this time and space that's ever-changing. And you're living out your own earthly life unto death. And, and you know, you got a bank full of money and, and, and the Lord says, give it all over here. You just do it. Because that's not your source. Your bank account's not your source. And you're not living in fear that you're going to go broke by sitting on it. You know who your source is. And you got one agenda. This one who gave it all for you and you give it all to Him. you got one ambition. That's to please Him. It's obedience. It's not impress people. 
And oftentimes when you're obedient, it brings ridicule. I, I would say every time it brings ridicule. Now that good name is not something that you go and grab. It's something that comes when you walk in the favor of God Almighty and He gives you the favor of men. But oftentimes those men have to attack you first. You know, and, and what, let me tell you what gets embarrassed. Your pride. Pitiful, rebellious I being deified and exalted in my own mind. Selfish willy, self-will who's wanting to impress all these people and get a good name. And, and when you're embarrassed, you're embarrassed because somebody has offended you or said something about you. When, now listen to the more intimate you become with him and the more yielded you are and, and trust the Lord with all your heart and all becomes more every day. Okay, you're still on the potter's wheel and I am too. And he's begun to work in it. He's going to complete it, but we're not totally selfless like Jesus yet, okay? Sometimes I stumble, sometimes I fall, sometimes I don't think I'm going to make it. I get down and out, my mind's filled with doubt, and I wonder how much longer can I take it. Then I repent of the sin that's out to do me in. I get cleansed and filled with His praise. What's exciting to me is being set free and growing more like my Lord every day. And I don't claim to be an all-pro saint, but I'm getting there. God knows I'm a long way from being selfless and perfect like Jesus, but I'm heading there. You see, the Lord's called me to victory, not a life of defeat and despair. And we don't claim to be all pro saints, but we're getting there. So as he's working on us as selfless, and we find ourselves blessing even those who curse us. Now, if someone is not at all interested in living the Sermon on the Mount, that person is not a Christian. And under the sun, in time and space in this Bible belt buckle called Southeast United States and all over the planet, really, legalism, do right to be right, is He calls you and you hear Him clearly. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Now when somebody, when somebody is treating you unjustly, you have to deny yourself to bless them instead of curse them. Wait, God, I, now wait a minute. You say all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution? That's a promise I don't want. I want a feel-good Jesus that will just come and stroke myself well and I can manipulate God through Him. And I'll pray a prayer and you'll help me through my self-centered life of getting stuff. That's the wrong one. If the gospel you're hearing is self-centered to accommodate your worldly kingdom, it's the wrong one. He doesn't exist for me, I exist for Him. Who's my Lord? Now listen, we got a lot of... Oftentimes, there, there is a burst of emotions that come. And, and how can, when your eyes are, are, are open to the reality of who He is... Some people are calm and be still and know that He's God, and some, some of us pitch a fit, you know, and it's, it's just like go ahead and cry it out and go ahead and shout glory, hallelujah, whatever it is. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of the shouting glory, hallelujah, is the dog and pony show. Some of us get zapped from heaven and everything changes, but not everybody. For most, it's a process. And, you know, and, and you may shout and jump and get excited and just slain in the Spirit. But here's the question. When you get up, are you still bossing people around? Who are you when you get up off the floor? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Are you blessing those who curse you? Are you still living a self-willed life that loves people with a fish love that's got a hook in it? A lot of people speak in tongues. A lot of devils speak in tongues. You know a tree by its fruit, and you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? It's love. You know what love looks like? This is in Galatians 5, starting in 22. Gentleness, joy, patience, <coughs> meekness, temperance, and faith. And we begin to see the unseen, but you've got to deny yourself, and you're not trying to get a reputation to impress other people. Now, here's what happens. That reputation is not to be grasped. That reputation comes 
when you let go of everything, all of your riches and great possessions, and you're willing to do it, okay? He gives you the grace, but you gotta be willing to. And when you're willing to do that, then what starts happening is he always, always vindicates you, always. You're gonna look like crap when you're getting pruned and everything, people are gonna be mistreating you, it would treat you with disrespect and everything else, and that's a season. But I'll tell you, you keep denying yourself and following him, he's gonna vindicate you, he's gonna raise you from the dead, you're being pruned, and when you're being pruned, you don't look good, but you're gonna come out of there bearing fruit like crazy, and he's gonna give you a good name. Look at him. He didn't have a good name on the cross that day. But he was given no credibility to the rebellion, and that's what you do. You love the soul of that person who is treating you unjustly. And you know what you hear the Lord saying? And this is the only way you can endure it. You're not growing weary and losing heart, Hebrews 12, because you are considering Him, not yourself. The one that's breaking your heart, you cry yourself to sleep at night, but you're not there crying yourself to sleep at night alone, and you do not defend yourself. You do not take sides. You do not resist evil with evil or return insult for insult. You're just sitting there, and your selfishness is just dying. And you hear him say, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Lord, you and I are on an intimate basis right now, and... And I'm free to ask you questions, and you're holding me, and I know, and I want to thank you for that. And you tell me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow you. Do you mind if I ask you where you're leading me? He said, I'm setting you up as a target. Huh? Thanks a lot. I'm, you've got a cross, too. And do you want to know why I'm doing it, he says? <laughs> I'm setting you up as a target so that I can save those that are taking shots at you. And the very people who are cursing you and criticizing you and using you, when they see that you got an anchor in the storm and they can't control you, you cannot respect anybody that will let you control them. And when you're standing there anchored in him it may be years later it comes full circle and the Holy Spirit has haunted them with the Jesus they saw in you when you were suffering in the flesh committing yourself to a faithful creator and he lifts you and he confirms you and he establishes you and he vindicates you and I'm telling you what what you thought you lost and you didn't you weren't clinging to it anyway he multiplies it times 100 and puts it right in your lap there's your good name a little boy and his dad the fun they could have had except his daddy was on the run so he grew up all in all, all alone the only home that he's known is a broken one his daddy chased the buck, played the social game, called it luck. They said he'd won. The little boy who ran away, they found his body today. Fame and fortune can't buy a son. Mister, you got the world on a string. Fancy cars and diamond rings. You got women at your beck and call. But winner, you're the biggest loser of all. He had no place to lay his head. The crowd wanted him dead, so they cried, crucify him. He stood before the mob. The only crime he was guilty of was loving them. So far away from home, he died all alone. They cheered, claimed they'd won. The loser who died that day, they found his body today, spreading throughout this earth the light of God's Son. You saved the world from our sin. It was the outcast who took you in. Now all of creation is at your beck and call. Loser, you're the greatest winner of all. A good name. You don't try to get it. He gives it to you. And you've come out of that time of rejection and being pruned and being the object of ridicule and injustice, you come out more and more aware of the one who was sustaining you there. Now this thank you therapy thing, this 1 Thessalonians 5.18, this is the will of God that you give thanks. 
in the Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious about nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. This thank you therapy that we constantly hear. Now let me tell you what, when all hell is broken loose around you and you're reaping what you sowed, and you're through blaming, blaming everybody else but from the DA to the policeman that arrested you or, or whatever it is, or the woman or the man who cheated on you, stole your stuff and all that, and you, you're going through life whining and complaining and backbiting and all that, calling yourself a Christian, excuse me. The way you know a real follower of Christ is their attitude of gratitude. Thanksgiving comes out and the attitude totally changes because you're seeing life from a totally different perspective and it's the perspective of reality and of truth. And you're constantly giving thanks. Now, now watch this. Deny yourself. When I am hurting and it looks like it's not working, I have to deny myself to thank Him. Now what am I going to thank Him for? You look at that cross. You look at that innocent man. And you look, and he's looking at you. Copyrighted thumbprint. Knows your thoughts before you think them. Loves you as if you're his only child. And you look at him, and what are you going to whine and complain about? You're guilty, he's innocent. And let me tell you what comes out of you. An eternal sigh of relief and gratitude. Oh my God. When we've been there 10,000 years, by the way, you don't die, your body dies. Everybody lives somewhere forever. How do you know that? I just know I know that, man. Life is just, the, the one who created all this, he didn't create it to shut it down. I mean, it's just glorious, this incredible creation. You know, look at the blue in the sky. Look at the butterfly fly by. Look at the tree so high. Look at the sparkle in the little child's eyes. Look at the man on the cross. That's what eternal life costs. Think about his love for you, and you know what that'll do? It'll give you an attitude of gratitude. And you keep giving him thanks. When you don't feel like it, you have to deny yourself to thank him. Do it. Don't come off of those two words. Now, you've been trained to have conversations with people in your mind that aren't there. You got a cage in your heart and you got somebody in there that mistreated you or embarrassed you in public or something like that and every once in a while you get them out of that cage and you beat them up and put them back in there. You want them dead and you're drinking the poison. And what did Jesus say? Bless those who curse you. And he said, I'm not telling you to do that for any other reason than to liberate you. Oh, I love this. This happens all the time. A couple will come. Domestic violence. World War III. In the home of the honeymooners. And I got a word from the Lord for me years ago. And I just pass it on. Now let me tell you something about the feminine gender. The woman. Every woman needs a strong shoulder to cry on. Mm -hmm. Her tears of fear and frustration is her instinctive way of testing the foundation of her man and what his life is built upon. Mm -hmm. Every woman needs a strong shoulder to cry on. Brother, who's leading who when she's controlling you? She knows how to push your buttons, Mr. Macho Man. And you can't stay out of the frying pan. You say you love her? Well, how are you going to cover her when you won't leave her alone? You keep throwing stones, oblivious to the fact that every woman needs a strong shoulder to cry on. Riding a bull don't make you a man. Fighting over a bag full of zipped up air and getting a glass football don't make you a man. <coughs> Having a bank full of money don't make you a man. Being president of the United States don't make you a man. Driving around in the, in the middle of thousands of people, watching you go around in a circle with Viagra painted on your hood, making a bunch of noise don't make you a man. Every man must walk through the doorway to freedom alone. 
admit that he needs help. And he's the one who needs a strong shoulder to cry on. Every man needs a strong shoulder to cry on. His tears of fear and frustration is a result of God arranging his situation in order to bring him to a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ who just happens to be the chief cornerstone. And he's the only strong shoulder a man or a woman can cry on. Every man and every woman needs a strong shoulder to cry on. And all she's got to do is just say something to you and she pushes a button and makes you mad. Who's controlling who? How can you lead her to freedom if you're in bondage to her bondage and how can you be free when you're complaining and shifting the blame for her? Or anybody else. He can't use you to lead somebody to freedom if you're in bondage to their bondage. And not only does she not respect you, you don't respect yourself. This can be your liberation day where the liberation begins. And let me just tell you what your part is and my part is. Are you willing to let go of whatever you will have to let go of one day anyway when your vibrator goes off and it's time for you to leave your body? Are you willing to? Welcome to freedom. You're now living under the S-O-N. And he's restoring your sanity. <coughs> and now life can be F-U-N. Free from worry. And you know all is going to be okay. <coughs> because you are willing to let go of what you'll have to let go of one day anyway. And he gives you that good name that you don't have to have. Most amazing thing. You know, I've been on this road with him for about close to 40 years now. Before that, I, was, I did a great job of earning my reputation. I was an addict and a, and a bad guy and, and in the horror of living a lie, you know, and I. Uh, And these past 40 years has just been this awakening to how faithful he is to me and my family. And you're my family. And what's so beautiful, you know, I share my heart here with you on, on Wednesdays. But I, I get along a lot. I treasure it. And you know what I do? Even though my computer right here don't remember names like it used to. <laughs> I guess it's so full of scripture and song lyrics or something, you know, but it's, and I may not remember your name or I may, but I'll never forget you, individual you. <laughs> and I lift you up to him and not making a public thing out of anything. It's private. And I can see you sitting there, here. And he brings it to mind, and I know that's him within me praying for you. And so many come through and are gone. And I still remember her. Not to worry about you, but to believe that you are going to experience the truth that sets you free. Thank you for joining us. This is Bob McLeod. If you'd like more information concerning Our Father's Arms, you can write us at Our Father's Arms, Post Office Box 1158, Jacksonville, Alabama 36265. Or visit us on the web at www.ourfathersarms.org. May the Lord Jesus Christ continue to give us eyes to see the unseen. Amen. Jesus loves you, do you know?